My plan for today is to center most of the discussion around your well-known book, namely The Mechanical Mind. So the subtitle of this book is a okay. philosophical introduction to minds, machines, and mental representation. And in the very first chapter, you say that this book is devoted to the problem of mental representation. So I want to ask you, before we get to mental representation itself, can you please explain what you mean by representation more generally and then get into the interesting problem related to the mind? Yes, so in, in the most abstract sense, by representation, I mean one thing standing for something else. So one thing um, conveying some information about something else or one thing being about something else or one thing um, in, in, in some way you know, depicting or describing or uh, symbolizing another thing. Um, so I use the word representation to cover all those things, to cover pictures, which pictures which represent something, um, words which say something, which are used to say something, and, uh, and other forms of representation too, symbols, hieroglyphs, and things like this. So I don't know, even the logo of a football team, say, would call us a representation of that uh, particular uh, football team? Absolutely, yeah. So, yeah. So. So once we have this notion of representation, what is the interesting philosophical problem that it poses? Well, I start the book by um, raising what I think to be is quite an intuitive puzzle about, about representation, which is um, um, if you look at a representation of something, a symbol or a word or a picture, you can ask yourself the question, what is it about that picture or symbol or word that makes it represent what it does? Um, so why does the, um, as in your example, why does the, the, the logo for the Liverpool football team represent Liverpool? Um, why, why is it that when someone sees that on a, on a, on a shirt or on, or on a poster that, that they will be made to think of Liverpool? Why is that? Um, now, I, um, that, that's a quite general question and sort of, it's a, uh, philosophical question because it's about a certain sort of puzzlement that you get when you look at the world from the, in a certain way. Um, I mean, I start the book with the example of um, uh, a spaceship from, um, the, the real case of a spaceship from, from many years ago, which was sent out into outer space. And on it, they, there was a symbol, uh, a picture of um, various things about our planet, uh, a man and a woman with their hands raised in greeting and, um, various other pieces of uh, information and um, and I found that striking because how did why do they think that when someone finds this in outer space millions of light years away when this thing this thing has traveled forever and ever and ever why do they think that any of these things are real really representations of anything why do they think they mean anything why would anyone think that if there were people out there to look at these pictures um, so I think there's a sort of intuitive puzzle there, which then we need to start taking apart. So you say that the reason they represent that is that because the mind interprets uh, its sensory input. So you then get into the puzzle of mental representation itself. Can you please explain this transition uh, in a bit more detail? Yes, that's right. That's the, so that's the, the line I, I want to take. I want to say that any any other kind of representation is only a representation because it's used by human beings or thinkers of some, of some kind. It's used by human beings or thinkers to be a representation, to represent something. So words represent because we use them to represent. Pictures represent, I think, because we use them to represent things. Um, and so I think that that then pushes the question of what is the nature of representation back into the mind. Ask yourself, well, what is it about mental representations that make them represent what they do um, and that's uh, and then that so that's why so from starting from a general question about representation i moved to a question about mental representation thoughts beliefs intentions desires imagination perception and so on all these things which represent the world how do they represent why can't we just be content with all right the mind interprets that that's how things manage to represent and that's all um, why, uh, why is this a mysterious thing from a philosophical point of view? Well, actually, that's a very 
big question and um, one I think that um, the book, um, I, I mean, I end up in the book saying that uh, in a certain sense, we have to take representation as a, as a basic notion, as something which is just, which we can say things about, but we're never going to get a sort of definition of it in other terms which don't involve ideas um, related to representation. Um, that's what I call in the end the non-reductive view of, of representation. Um, but I think there's a very, um, the, the quick answer to your question is that, that people think, many philosophers think, that the, the human mind is a material phenomenon in the sense that the human mind is either identical with the brain or it's deeply dependent on the brain or mental capacities just are capacities of the brain or of the or of the organism and it seems to be a very uh, anomalous feature of the world or, or rather an unusual feature of the material world that anything should represent anything so if you start with this idea that that the mind is material then representation looks like that's a special reason for thinking that representation is a puzzling phenomenon um, so that's the uh, that's the the puzzle of mental representation for materialists. When I started off, when we first started talking a few minutes ago, talking as if there was a quite general problem of representation for anyone who 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 thinks at all can see this thing to be puzzling, and that that would apply to the mind too. Um, if then you ask me, as you did, well, why why not just take mental representation for granted and form, explain all other forms of representation in terms of that? Um, then I think one response, although it's not mine, is to is to say, well, that's because the mind is a physical thing, a material thing. And we don't really understand how a material thing can represent anything in and of itself. But some people take the mind to be an immaterial substance that is distinct from the physical body. Does this problem of mental representation arise within both uh, materialist and dualist conception of the mind? Well, I've, I've, I've come to the view now um, that it doesn't. Um, in, in the book, I'm, I take the more standard view, or I describe the more standard view, which is that um, an immaterialist view of, um, of the mind has just as much of a problem with mental representation as a materialist view has. Yes. Um, um, let me just explain why I think that actually is not correct now. Uh, and this is something that I'm um, now been thinking a lot about. Um, what's an immaterial substance? Well, if we go back to the in the tradition of um, of Western philosophy, the paradigm philosopher who discussed this and put forward the view that the mind was a material substance was, of course, um, Descartes in the 17th century. And Descartes said that substance, what, what he meant by substance was the ultimate realities of the world, the things, the basic entities in the world. Each mind was what he called a substance. It was something that was capable of independent existence. That's what a substance is. The difference between mental substances and, and material substances is, is given by their characteristic attribute. And the attribute or feature, if you like, or fundamental feature or essential property of, um, of, of physical substance, material substances, that it is extended. That is to say, it has size and shape. The attribute of um, of mental substance is that it is a thinking substance. It has the attribute of thought, by which Descartes included all um, conscious um, um, episodes and all conscious phenomena. So it cannot be a good question for someone who believes in immaterial substance uh, to ask, how can an immaterial substance, defined as Descartes just defined it, be capable of thinking or representing because an immaterial substance just is a substance by definition whose characteristic attribute is thought so it'd be like asking but how can a, a how can a material substance matter how can matter be extended you say well you're asking the wrong question because matter is the substance whose characteristic attribute is extension now you might think that that all this talk about substances and attributes is a bad way to go anyway and i'm i'm inclined to think think that myself. But my point is rather um, a, an argumentative or, or dialectical one, which is that mm. 
immaterial substance uh, is not the sort of thing about which you can ask, um, how is it possible for an immaterial substance to think, since immaterial substance has been characterized in terms of the attribute of thought. Right? So I don't think that, I now don't think that's a, a good um, question for the dualist who believes in an immaterial substance. However, I don't think we should be talking about substance in Descartes' sense at all. I think this is not a category that we should be thinking in terms of. Um, um, so then the question is, what remains of the problem of representation if you don't think in terms of material and immaterial substance? Um, a familiar setting where we find this notion of representation uh, is obviously computers. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask you uh, this question in the most direct way, as you in, uh, title your chapter. Can a computer think? Uh, well, the direct answer is no. <laughs> um, I think we have to distinguish here a number of different different questions. Um, uh, can a computer think? Um, normally, what people mean when they ask that question is, can an artificial computer that we that we invent um, be capable of real thought? Um, and the answer to that question for me is. Um, thinking does not in, involve simply um, processing information or representing or computing functions by using algorithms and heuristics. Um, we, there's no reason to, there's no good reason to think that that exhausts thinking, what we call thinking. Um, so I don't think anything could think simply by computing. However, there's a, there's another question, which is, do we in any way, in any sense at all, think by computing? Do we, is computing or computation part of the story about how we think? Um, and that question I think is a much more complicated answer and um, I think there's a lot to be said for that, uh, for saying yes to that. So the, the, so the distinction is between saying, could anything think simply by being a computer? And is thinking, is computing part of the, the story about how we think? One's a question about artificial intelligence, the other is a question about the nature of our psychology. But can you please expand on why uh, an AI that manages to pass the Turing test would not be classified as a thinking machine? Passing the Turing test means giving responses to questions which are indistinguishable from the responses that a human being um, could give. Now, supposing you could get a computer, uh, some sort of computer that could pass the Turing test. I mean, so far nothing's managed to do it, but um, supposing you could. Um, that doesn't, that only implies that thing is really a thinking thing if your, your criterion for being a thinking thing is purely, so to speak, third personal and behavioristic. Um, so, in other words, if you're just looking at the behavior of the organism or the behavior of the machine, and you want to read off whether something is thinking simply from that behavior, um, then um, passing the Turing test does not guarantee thinking, does not entail thinking. Now you might say, well, that's just, we're in the same position with other people, because yes. all we see is their behavior. Um, and of course that's true in the sense that all we, we all we are aware of is their behavior, but we're also aware of them as, as living, breathing organisms. And we see the expressions in their face and we see, um, the, we see, uh, you know, I see, you see friendliness in someone's smile. You can see anger in their eyes, you know, you can see all these things. Um, it's not just a matter of exchanging sentences with a, um, on a, on a, on a computer terminal. But what if we create a robot that manages to pass a Turing test in a behavioristic way that is not only reduced to texting? Well, that's a different question now, because now you bring in the idea of a robot. And now you bring in the idea that behavior or um, acting or the expression, perhaps, of, uh, of thoughts and feelings um, is um, part of the evidence that we use to, to um, figure out whether something is thinking. And that wasn't part of the original Turing test. Um, so I think anyone who's going to say 
uh, we can build an artificial thinker is going to have to go down the route of building something like a robot. That's certainly true. Uh, you need, you need the, the artificial thinker would need to be embodied. Um, I'm not saying that that's sufficient to get a ro to, to, for something to be a thinker, that it, that it walks and talks and behaves like a thinker. But that's the direction you'd have to go in. Um, but remember that artificial intelligence, as it's practiced right now, is not the theory of robotics. Um, robotics is another thing. Arti artificial intelligence is trying to extract cognitive or pseudo-cognitive processes and uh, implement those processes in, in computers. So you are tempted to agree that a behavioral test might be good enough if it's complex enough. I mean, you think that texting doesn't, uh, doesn't cut it, but if you allow uh, the test to be complex enough in, uh, in that we can interact with the robot, I guess you'd want to see it cry, but make jokes and be, uh, have empathy towards other people, you might label that as pretty solid evidence that we should not uh, label it as unconscious or unthinking. I don't want to go that far. I mean, I, I want to say that um, we, that if that in our case, the evidence that we use is the evidence of people acting, living, breathing people acting, and we know acting and expressing their thoughts and feelings. Right? So if anyone were trying to create something that was a genuine and artificial thinker, then they would, um, um, then they would have to create something that, that, was, an, that was an agent. What exactly that involves is then another question. What's the threshold? Where do you, where, where do you do, where do you manage to create something that is actually uh, expressing feelings rather than just um, simulating them, or um, actually genuinely acting and pursuing things rather than just simulating it? Um, where you would create something that you could actually, that you yourself could actually react to as a human being, that you could actually. Um, feel emotion towards or feel compassion for or you would worry about you know hurting it or upsetting it or something like this that's another huge question and no no one in artificial intelligence or robotics has anywhere near anywhere near the answer to that question I mean, they just they don't so i don't so i think what i want to say in response to your question is uh, yes of course we're much more complex but no one really understands what that level of complexity is. What, how are we measuring the complexity of a human being as opposed to um, uh, a, um, uh, a robot or a computer? Right? And we already know, for example, that you know, the computers are much, much better than us at, at things that, that I could never do, you know, like play chess very well or you know, the game of Go, you know, the, this marvellous um, machine, AlphaGo, that they built in London. Um, that, that is the world champion that beat the world champion at Go. I will never be able to play Go to, to any great level. I know that. And yet you look at a child, you look, what's the first game a child learns? You know, something like peekaboo. What does that involve? You know, hiding under a blanket and pulling down the, pulling down the blanket and laughing. The ch children can play this for hours. How do you, how do you program that into a computer? How do you, how do you even get a computer to whom such a game would even make sense? So you're saying that computation cannot be the whole story uh, about our mental life, but certainly it should be uh, a big part of it. So I want to ask you, what is the computational theory of cognition committed to? Yes. Um, the computational theory of com cognition can be taken, I think, in, in, in two ways. Um, one is, uh, which I think is standard and uncontroversial, that um, it, uh, computational psychologists treat mental processes as if they were computations. And so they model these processes by um, using computer programs to um, relate various forms of input to various forms of output. So you can have a computational model of the visual system um, representing the input to the visual system uh, as the um, the distribution of light on, on the retina and representing the output as the, as they say, the three-dimensional description of, of the environment. Um, so it's one thing to say you can model a process on a computer, and I think that's, that's commonly taken to standard methodology in cognitive science that you, you, have, you model mental processes computationally. 
Um, it's another thing to say that the brain or the mind actually performs those computations. That is, the brain actually does adds and subtracts symbols, so to speak. You know, that there are actually symbols in the brain and the processes in the brain are actually computations. Um, now, I think that distinction is very important between modeling something computationally and something actually being a computation. Um, some philosophers think it's not so important and there's a philosophical dispute about that. Um, the strongest view of the, um, uh, the, second, the second version of the view, which is um, the, the view that the mind actually performs computations, uh, is the famous um, um, representational theory of mind defended by Jerry Fodor, where Fodor said that in order for there to be computations in the brain, there had to be a, um, a language for this computation, which he called a language of thought, uh, which, is, which is like a, uh, a computer language in the brain. And the individual symbols in the brain which have you know, syntactic and semantic properties like a language. And Fodor famously defended that view. Um, and when I wrote the first version of the book in 1995, I think perhaps the view was, was more taken more seriously. I think now it's um, this is the, the, um, the third edition of the book, 2015, um, things have changed a lot. And I think now it would be fair to say that there's much less enthusiasm for that strong computational view. But still, let's try to understand it a bit deeper. Uh, why is it called the language? Is that because we have some atomic symbols that can be put together in a sort of combinatorial fashion and those atomic symbols stand for things? I, I saw that one of the nice features of this theory is that it can account for some uh, linguistic desirable features that we have, namely that we can think an infinity of thoughts and that given a sentence we can derive its whole meaning by their by their meaning of their parts and their syntactic syntactic arrangement but that has to do with words and full sentences but a similar thing applies to the mental symbols themselves that's why they are called the language because they have a syntax and a semantics right exactly yes you described it perfectly i mean the um so a language of thought or a language of mental representation um has, um, has to have two features. First is the, that the, there have to be symbols and the symbols have to be meaningful, but also that the symbols have to fit together in a certain way, uh, in a way that's known as compositional. So that, that is to say that the meaning of larger symbols depends on the meanings of the smaller symbols. So you start off with the smallest symbols, calling the atomic symbols, you put to, those together, and you make a large symbol, just as you put words together to make a sentence. So uh, Fodor argued that thought has to be like a language in that sense, because um, mental processes have a certain systematic character that when, you, when, you, when you're thinking something, your symbols hang together uh, in a way in which they do, that when you express those, those thoughts in, in language. Um, and then the other systematic is one feature. The other, the other feature, as you mentioned, is, is what Fodor called productivity, which is um, that it's possible for us to think an indefinite number of new thoughts. Um, there seems to be no limit on the number of thoughts we can actually think. Um, we can, you can consider new thoughts every day. Um, and if each thought was a separate, individual, discrete element, this would be rather puzzling. Fodor says that our ability to think new thoughts or to, to, for our thought to be productive is best explained by the idea that there are simple parts of thoughts which are put together to make the new thoughts, rather as in the case of language, you know, I can utter sentences which, which, which I've never uttered before by putting together the words that I already know. But if computation is not sensitive to the contents of uh, these symbols, to what they stand for, how does Fodor explain our ability to reason correctly? Uh, for instance, our ability to derive Q from the premises P implies Q and P. I mean, how, how do we explain our ability to reason in a meaningful way? Well, there are, there are two things here. I mean, one is the ability to reason considered as a, as a psychological um, 
uh, ability or capacity, which is exercised in particular chains of reasoning. And the other is the implementation of that in the language of thought. As you say, um, the, the causal process of reasoning takes place at the level of the symbols themselves, that is to say, the, the bits of the brain that are considered to be the representations and the way they all, the way they all hang together as, as the symbols in a computer would do. Um, the meaning of those symbols uh, is, what the, is what those symbols are supposed to be implementing. But there's a big question of how the symbols come to get their meaning in the first place and how do we explain, therefore, correct transitions from one bunch of symbols to another. Um, that's one of the things that Fodor tries to explain. Um, the puzzle for him is that it looks like there's this, the mechanism of, of thinking and what he's calling the syntactic level uh, where you can manipulate the symbols um, independently of what they mean, so to speak, um, that the mechanism of thinking is kind of blind to the meanings of those, those symbols. Um, so is it fair to say that uh, the processes by which we reason resemble in a way the logic gates that are implemented in computers? Yes, that's the image, yeah. yeah. Just as in the logic gate you can represent and or or um, through um, um, certain electric um, processes. Um, so the idea is that we represent logical structure of thought is represented by the electrochemical processes in our brains. But speaking again of computers and AlphaGo that you mentioned, a lot of the current artificial intelligence research centers on ideas such as uh, neural networks and deep learning, which takes computation to be akin to the way our neural structure really works. I mean, interconnected neuro neurons via synapses. So you have, we have networks of nodes that are connected and those connections have some weights attached upon them and, and the computers learns, computer learns more or less like a baby. Uh, is there any tension between the connectionist views of the mind and the language of thought that we just discussed? Or we can say that uh, a neural network might just implement the language of thought? Well, that's a very big question. Um, I think they, they are conceived to be very different. Uh, and certainly if um, from an artificial intelligence point of view, they're treat, they would be treated as very different um, because the, um, the, the language of thought picture goes more with the old fashioned uh, early first generation artificial intelligence um, programs, so so-called rules and representations um, conception of, of of AI, um, whereas the, the neural networks, um, which are now or used for things like you know pattern recognition and um, speech recognition and um, face recognition and all and all these things, and things like uh, training a machine to to learn how to play Go, um, this is a very different kind of computational architecture. Um, now Fodor argued that if, if connectionism was going to be a theory of human thinking or anything like it, the connectionist or, or neural network model was gonna be anything like a theory of human thinking, then it would have to simply implement something like an art, a language of thought structure um, um, because it would have to preserve systematicity and productivity, which were the key features of um, our thinking. Um, I think that's a, I mean, that's a huge empirical question, which um, I, I, I think, um, and what Fodor is, ch it's a challenge for, for, uh, for anyone who's gonna do a theory of human thinking, but um, I, I don't think it's widely accepted that this challenge needs, needs to result in something like a language of thought. Um, so there's one, one, I mean, again, we've got, to, we've got to distinguish the AI question from the, from the theory of human psychology. Um, and uh, the fact that deep learning systems and, um, have been successful at certain things that traditional AI has been unable to do um, is very interesting and a very important fact. And the success has been spectacular. Um, but AI isn't a theory of human psychology. So even if they call these things neural networks, um, the similarities to, the, to neurons are at a very abstract level. 
But why does Fodor think that a neural network cannot account for a systematicity without a language of thought? Because he thinks that the basic idea of the language of thought is that the units of representation have to be the units of computation. Um, so the, the things the, the, the things that actually participate in the in the computational process itself at the computationally significant level have to be the things that represent things in the world. Um, and that's not obviously true in a neural network system, that the units of computation are the, the nodes and the, the, um, the, 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 the relations between them. Um, and if there's going to be something like a representation, it's going to be supplied you know, basically by the interpreter at the end. They interpret the output in a certain way, just as they interpret the input in a certain way. Um, now, Fodor thinks that that's the only way that, that having the units of representation being the units of computation is the only way to really explain how thought can be embodied, or the only plausible way, he says. He doesn't think it's... He doesn't think it necessarily follows, but he thinks this is the, absolutely the best explanation. So whatever the connections machine is doing at the level of the relationship between the nodes in the network, um, if, this, if we're going to solve the problem of how thought is embodied in a physical process, we have to see that as a lower level than the level of um, processing of representations. Speaking of neural networks, what do you think are the prospects for deep neural networks to be uh, sophisticated enough to generate awareness? Uh, I don't, I'm very skeptical about um, the prospects. Um, I mean, one, okay, you asked, your question is about awareness. Um, so let's put that to one side for a moment. I mean, it, there's, a, there's another question, which is about whether um, deep learning systems can produce what people like to call AGI, that is artificial general intelligence, right. uh, as, a, as opposed to uh, the ability to solve specific um, problems or within a certain task domain. Um, so for example, you know, my neural networks are, are very good now at um, um, recognizing, identifying faces, where recognition here just means um, l associating an image with, with a label. Um, now, um, that's very important, and that's a useful thing, um, but how do we get from there to the, to the um, prospect of general intelligence, the sort of intelligence that we have, the sort of intelligence that where we, which we can apply to um, any subject matter. And I think the difficulty here is that no one's really come up with any characterization of what general intelligence is. Um, and this is where I think it's important to stress the similarities between old fashioned AI and um, deep learning machines. Um, the similarities as much as the differences. The similarities are, you know, you, you, you design a computer in order to do a certain thing, and you specify what that task is, what you want the computer to do. So, I mean, take the case of Go, you know, incredibly impressive um, uh, achievement to how to build a machine that could beat the world champion of Go. But Go is a game. Go is a game with rules, and we know what the end point is. The end point is winning the game. Um, that you can say what it is to win a game, just as you can say what it is to, you know, to win a game of chess. Um, you can say what it is to recognize a face and you can train the network to rec to you tell the network yes this is a picture of so and so this is a bit this isn't this is a picture of so and so this isn't and after a while they become very good at recognizing pictures of so and so um but we but there we can say what it is that the task is that we're trying to get the machine to achieve what is the task what's what is it that we're trying to get the machine to achieve in creating something called general intelligence I guess no one can give necessary and sufficient conditions for intelligence, but I mean, sufficient conditions would be quite hard, but do you have some preferred 
necessary conditions of intelligence. If you don't have any of the items that you're about to list, you should not be regarded as intelligent. Yeah, I think in a way intelligence isn't the word that I would ever have used in this whole, whole thing. Uh, I mean, the idea of artificial intelligence was that it's trying to build machines that do things which would require intelligence if done by uh, human beings. Um, I think the more fundamental thing is what is it to be a thinker? Um, yeah, and what, what, when would these machines ever count as thinking? And if they don't, if they, if they can't ever count as thinking, then they can't count as being intelligent. Right? So if there's going to be such a thing as AGI, artificial general intelligence, then the machines have to be thinkers in some way. They have to be genuinely thinking. Um, now, I, I'm, I think what is involved in being a thinker for us, um, and, as, and I do totally agree with you, there aren't necessary and sufficient conditions for, for these things. That's not how we should be thinking of it. But what is involved in being a thinker is part, part of it is that things matter to us and that we have values and that we care about certain things and things have meaning or significance for us. And our thoughts take place within within our lives and a life is something which you know involves relations to others and relations to the whole world embedded in a kind of network of significance or meaning right? so things have to mean something um, you know then john hoagland the philosopher who thought very deeply about these things you know he said um, the problem with computers is they don't give a damn this is what he said so um and recently, uh, some AI um, theorists have um, come up with similar views, actually, that uh, Brian Cantwell Smith has a, has a recent book called The Promise of Artificial Intelligence, where he, uh, um, he uses that idea, you know, really, that computers don't give a damn to show the huge gap between what it is that AI has actually achieved and what it would take to actually create a real thinking um, creature. Uh, so I'm. I don't see any prospect of um, AI as it actually is um, creating thinking machines, and I think, and that's and I and that's not to disparage AI. I think AI is an incredible scientific achievement. What what it's achieved, you know, what's there in your phone and in your computer is amazing, and, and no one could have envisaged that 50 years ago, 60 years ago. Um, but what they're not doing is trying to create thinking machines and they should give up on, they should give up on, on that way of representing themselves because that's, uh, it's, it's creating all sorts of, I think, um, um, spurious questions like, for example, you know, what do we do when the machines take over? You know, what do we do when the machines get desires of their own? And they decide that they're going to start running the stock market and these things. And you know, I think a lot of people ask these questions, they spent too much time in their, bedrooms playing video games when they were kids and uh, they, should, they should think about what's really involved in these machines and you know, we shouldn't worry about what they what, what's going to happen when the machines take over we should worry about what sort of people are going to be in charge of the machines leaving artificial intelligence aside let's get back to our minds uh, to the human minds can you please explain what you mean by the mechanical world uh, word in the book title what is a mechanical mind Yes, well, when I chose that title, it was a long time ago now, um, I wanted to fit the discussion of things like the mind as a computer, the mind as a, a, as a, as a causal mechanism uh, into a broad picture of the world, um, which I called the mechanical world picture, um, which was the world picture that comes from the 17th century of the, the scientific revolution. Um, where you think of things as not having any intrinsic purpose, but you think of things as just behaving as they do because of the regularity of the laws of nature. So a mechanism in, this, in, in, in that sense, something in the mechanical world picture, is uh, just simply something that behaves in a regular way, like a, like a clock or like um, things that, the way that think, things behave in accordance with the laws of physics. So how does that relate to our minds and our behavior? So I suppose I, what I was trying to say was that the um, contemporary computational theories of mind was a way of trying to fit the mind into, the, into a, a mechanical world picture to explain how the mind is part of the, of the um, mechanical world. Um, 
Now, various people have pointed out that I'm using the word mechanical in a very, in a very broad way here, and perhaps too broad to be um, useful. Um, but um, I preferred it to the material mind or the computational mind because it seemed to me to pick up something which was um, special, which explained what was particularly special about you know the theory of thinking here. That thinking has to be something that can be done by a certain kind of machine, namely the machine that is the human body or the human brain. Um, so I guess that the main thesis is that when you ask a why question about a piece of observable, observable behavior, it, to explain it is sufficient to uh, list the thoughts behind that behavior, right? Yes, I mean, and then, and then I suppose that the idea there is that the thoughts behind those, that behavior are the thoughts that cause the behavior. So you think of the relationship between thoughts and behavior as a causal, as a causal matter. Um, so fitting the mind into the causal structure of the world is the overall project. Um, and uh, I make the claim, which I, which I believe, which is that um, um, explaining people's behavior in terms of their thoughts uh, is a kind of causal explanation of their behavior. But doesn't this presuppose that the, uh, that the mental is linked appropriately with the body? What I mean by that is what would you say to someone uh, that discusses a patient with, say, locked-in syndrome who has the thoughts, but the behavior is really not there because he has no means of expressing uh, anything. He's locked in, he's paralyzed, and he cannot produce observable behavior. So you have the same thoughts, you have the causes there, but you don't have any uh, piece of observable behavior to analyze. Well, I think um, I distinguish between thoughts and behavior. So the idea that thought that there may be someone may have thoughts or an inner life or a consciousness uh, without being able to behave, express those thoughts and behavior um, is for me a consequence of distinguishing that. So I think they're very different things. So in the case of locked in syndrome, this, this tragic cases is that people are, are um, physiologically incapable of uh, expressing their thoughts and behavior. Um, um, the normal case is when people can express their thoughts and behavior and their thoughts cause their behavior. Um, but the fact that the fact remains that that normal case will break down in certain um, cases of um, pathological cases or cases of trauma. Right. Um, so I don't see any kind of definitional link between thought and behavior. Uh, thoughts and behaviors are, are separate things. Um, and so they can, they can come apart. Um, can this mechanical mind shed any light on the hard problem of consciousness? Is it compatible with our subjective experience and its link with the computational theory of cognition that we just discussed? The hard problem of consciousness is um, the problem of explaining how any, anything could be conscious at all. So in particular, any material thing or physical thing could be conscious. Um, what makes it the case that anything has any conscious experience at all. Um, uh, now, um, I believe that consciousness and thought are intimately related. Um, so I don't hold the view that an explanation of thought has nothing to do with an explanation of conscious, the explanation of consciousness. Um, Fodor had that view. Um, and um, David Chalmers, who used the term hard, the hard problem, um, uh, expressed it in those terms because Chalmers talks about what he calls a zombie, which is a creature who behaves, has all the all the representational mental states, um, which are unconscious and can behave just like a normal human being, but doesn't have any kind of consciousness. It doesn't feel like anything. Um, I'm very skeptical about these scenarios um, because I think thought and consciousness are intimately related but still um, you mention in the book that you might have unconscious thoughts uh what do you mean by that yeah so i do think there are there are unconscious beliefs and other mental processes i think there are mental i think there can be unconscious reasoning um can so, you give an example um well the two kinds of example really i mean one is um the sort of mental processes that go on when your brain um 
um, computes certain things. So the processing that goes on, um, which gets the information from your eyes to your visual cortex and from your visual cortex to, um, to conscious thinking, all, all that processing is unconscious, I think, and I think it's perfectly reasonable to call it mental. So there's mental processing in the brain, which is unconscious. But there's also just uh, the common sense mental states we talk about, like um, beliefs and intentions, uh, which can be unconscious too. So um, your your current your current belief that um, that your computer is um, weighs less than your house, for example, if you believe that. Um, and that belief is not something you've ever brought to consciousness, but it's something that in some way is something that you believe or a consequence of something that you believe. But do, so I, my, do I really believe it unconsciously where you just raise a scenario and I compute a verdict to the sort of question that is implied by, by your statement? I mean, is my laptop, does my laptop weigh less than the house? I think about it and I settle on it. Is that belief really unconscious? Well, whether or not you had that belief before or whether you settle on that belief, uh, I think it's undeniable that there are many other beliefs that you have which are not currently part of your conscious mind. Um, so your belief that you were born on a certain day, for example, wasn't something that you were thinking of before I just raised it now. Um, so uh, yes, you're absolutely right. You need to distinguish the case where you settle a question for yourself and where uh, the belief is already there, so to speak, in the background of your mind and it's something that doesn't, the belief doesn't go away when you stop being conscious of it. So belief is somehow a commitment to the truth of something uh, that governs your behavior, uh, which doesn't need to be brought to consciousness. Right. Is the notion of agency compatible with a mind that is mechanical? I mean, can we have free will on the mechanical mind picture? Right. So by agency here, you mean free, free agency? Yes. Yes. Um, well, I, th I think this is the, um, th this is one of the hardest problems in philosophy, it seems to me. Um, and it's hard because um, there is no satisfactory thing to say here. Um, the, I suppose the most satisfactory thing is the, um, uh, the compatibilist view that, yes, of course, we can have free will in a, in a causal worldview. The, the causal mechanical worldview just means that the causes of your actions are free when, as it may be, you could have done otherwise or some other, some other condition uh, obtains. Uh, and you could have done otherwise if things have been otherwise in the past. Um, and that's compatible with a uh, deterministic worldview. But I feel that somehow doesn't doesn't get to the heart of the uh, of what bothers people about free will, which is not just that you couldn't have done otherwise, but at, or that you could have done otherwise, but that at this moment now I could decide to do anything. Right, um, and um, that um, intuition, as people call it, of libertarian freedom is um, uh, is very powerful, and it's very hard to fit that into a um, into a view of nature as conceived by modern science, that's true. But do you think um, that we have free will? Are you a compatibilist yourself? I think we have free will, yes. Yeah. So I think if I had to tick a box, I would have to say compatibilist, but I don't find it a very satisfactory position and I don't have anything new or original to say about it. I, I hope that before I die, I might be able to think of something. How, you, how would you... What would you tell to someone who is concerned about this problem that, that you mentioned bothers people about free will? I mean, this very neural act that uh, takes place in my brain, which they think might actually generate the decision itself. What would you, what did, would you tell them to ameliorate their feelings? Well, on that particular question, I think I wouldn't, I'm, um, I don't think that's so much of a problem. I mean, I think the idea that there are neural precursors to your decisions um, should not be news to anybody. Um, what I think is would be a mistake would, would be to say, well, um, we should to identify those neural precursors to the decisions with the decisions themselves. Um, there may well be something which can be identified with the decision itself, but uh, it's not going to be something like what 
um, neuroscientists call the readiness potential yes. um, in, in the motor cortex. So it's, um, so I, I'm, I believe my general view about the relationship between the mind and the, and the brain is that, um, that we have mental capacities. The mental capacities are real. They're distinct from, from the capacities of neurons, but they arise out of them. They emerge from those things. Um, and they have a reality of their own. And they have an emergent reality of their own. <clears throat> so having said that, that still doesn't scratch the itch about um, libertarian freedom, which is that I feel that nonetheless, you know, even though, even though we have these mental capacities and they have a reality of their own and um, decisions are not the same things as readiness potentials and, but they are, they are acts of the, of, of, of the human subject. Nonetheless, the human subject is part of a causal order of the world and somehow causal order of the world has to accommodate genuine free action uh, that's the thing i have nothing to say about even though i believe i believe it's true some people use this um, explanatory gap between the physical description of our subjective awareness and the actual conscious experience itself to make room to bring uh, divine intervention to the picture they sort of bring god as uh, the bridging explanation between those two phenomena. How do you feel about those attempts? Well, as an atheist, I can't, I, I can't see any future in those attempts myself. Um, but this brings me back to what you said about the hard problem, which I didn't really finish talking about, if right. I may just say something about that. Um, the idea that there's an explanatory gap between the mind and the brain, I think is a very, um, um, uh, it's a very powerful idea that there's a gap somehow, there's something we just simply don't understand about how the brain can, can, can produce consciousness. Um, and I'm very interested in that. Um, but I think that we, what, I think we, need it, we need to think about this in a different way if we're going to make progress with it. Um, and we need to stop letting our thought be dominated by essentially skeptical scenarios like the like the zombie scenario instead ask um take seriously the idea that um if consciousness is going to be produced by the brain um there may be something that we're just not going to understand at a certain point we won't be able to deduce the nature of consciousness from what we know about the brain but that doesn't mean there aren't lots of other things that we can understand um, so you know, we might be, you know, it might be part of an understanding of how pain feels, for example, that we just that we we know that we distinguish between, you know, the, the sharp pain that comes through the the fast acting uh, nerve fibers going to the pain centers of the brain, uh, from the 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 slow throbbing pain that comes from the the, the slow firing uh, uh, nerves. Now this this could be a very very if we think. In those terms, we think, well, what actually is kept the connection between the nature of the experience and the nature of the, of the um, underlying uh, cause? Um, I think we have to take that seriously and think seriously in, in functionalist terms about how all those bits fit together uh, without thinking, oh, but if, we, but if we knew how all those bits fit together, we'd be able to deduce what it was like to have an experience from it. Um, we have to give up that idea that we're going to be able to deduce anything from anything. We're just looking, what we're looking for is causal coronations and connections. Um, and that, that, uh, and we're looking for that at a level of detail, which will start to satisfy us. Um, so I'm, from this point of view, I'm a, I'm a totally naturalistic philosopher. I think that the, the hard problem will be solved naturalistically. Um, but it's not going to be solved all in one go by getting a magical deduction. Um, it's, it's rather like, you know, some people say that solving the problem of consciousness is, is like um, getting a man on the moon. You know, we know what it is to get the man on the moon. We, we got the, they, they fire the rocket and you land on the moon and then you plant the flag. That's what it is. Yeah. But it may be much more like curing cancer. There's no one thing, one thing that counts as curing cancer. But nonetheless, an enormous amount of progress has been made and a lot of cancers can now be cured. Um, 
but there isn't one magic key to curing cancer. So maybe that's a better analogy. Yeah. You mentioned that you're an atheist, but you wrote a recent book uh, called The Meaning of Religious Belief. Uh, what do you think Meaning, is... The meaning of belief. The meaning of belief. Was the called. meaning of belief. I'm sorry about it. Um, what do you think is fundamentally misguided about how new atheists approach this problem and what motivated you to write this book yourself? Um, I, well, I've been in, interested in religion all my life and I was brought up a Catholic and um, then I stopped believing, um, but I've always maintained an interest in, in Christianity and I have an interest in Islam as well. And, um, um, and I see the discussions by by atheist philosophers and scientists um, as representing um, religious belief in a way that believers themselves don't, don't um, recognize. Um, so I got interested in what that could be. Why is it that, you know, when, when uh, Richard Dawkins in the, the God Delusion presents all these irrefutable arguments against the arguments for the existence of God, you know, why is it that the, the believers don't um, sit down and say, okay, yeah, you're right, okay. Or you're right about this one, but not about that one. Um, or oh, I have to reconsider my whole belief. Um, now, there are a number of answers you could give to that question. Um, but my, the answer I'm, I pursue in the book is that uh, Dawkins and others misrepresent the overall character of religious belief. Uh, and um, they see it in terms of two things. One is um, a sort of cosmological hypothesis about the nature of the world, the nature of reality. Uh, and the other is um, a moral commands. So that religion is a sort of conjunction of, um, of cosmology and morality, a sort of proto-cosmology and a, and, a, and a morality. Um, and I think one thing that um, this obviously misses out is um, what I call religious practice. I mean, what that is the fact that people do things like go to church and do, um, or light candles, or um, eat certain things at certain times, or wear certain clothes. And these don't have anything obviously to do with cosmology or with morality. So, um, what there so i i identify religion is instead in an alternative way in terms of two two things and this is all at a very abstract level and then again it's not supposed to be necessary in sufficient conditions but rather painting a picture of what's going on um uh, one of those things is what i call the um the religious impulse the religious impulse i say is the is the sense that there must be more to the world than just the things that we see around us that there must be more to it the sense of the transcendent, the sense of something beyond all this. Um, um, that's one aspect. And the other aspect is what I call identification, which is belonging, having a, a, a group of people that you belong to uh, and who are different from the people you don't belong to. Uh, and I think we can make better sense of, of what many things that are called religion involve. Uh, if we think in terms of those two ideas rather than in terms of the cosmology plus morality picture. But I guess what someone like Dawkins would say that a lot of people really take the um, primitive cosmology claim seriously. I mean, even I can relate that uh, to this feeling. A lot of people that seem to be religious really reject the truth of evolutionary theory and believe literally in Adam and Eve. They really believe in creation. So even though they are united and they are comforted by, their, uh, by the psychological well-being of being part of the group that attends church together, they also share some beliefs that uh, the new atheists deem to be fundamentally flawed. So do you really think your characterization of religion really captures what an average uh, believer thinks? Because I guess a lot of them are frustrated with the beliefs, them. a lot of atheists are frustrated, frustrated with the beliefs themselves. I mean, not necessarily with the, thing, the fact that someone hopes that there should be more to the world. No one has any problem with that. Um. Well, actually, I, I mean, I have a problem with that because I don't think there is more to the world than all this. I mean, I think the empirical world is pretty much the world that there is. So I think I, I don't have a, 
urge for the transcendent at all, and I don't believe in the transcendent, and that's why I'm an atheist. Um, you're absolutely right, of course, and, and I, I, um, uh, what, what you say is entirely consistent with my view. So, I mean, there are various different ways of developing the idea that um, that there is this transcendent reality, and and one of one of them involves, say, in in um, uh, you know certain kinds of American fundamentalism, for example. Christian fundamentalism uh, involves um, things like denying the truth of evolution by natural selection. Um, I don't want to build into my abstract description of religion anything that entails that evolution isn't true, um, but it's certainly consistent with the picture of religion that I paint, that people can have all these false views about religion or cosmology, about evolution or cosmology. Um, so how do you accommodate your views on tolerance with those uh, misguided teachings that a lot of fundamentalists uh, yeah, teach children? Um, yeah, well, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't tolerate people being taught falsehoods at school. If my children went, went to a school where people said that um, the world was created 4,000 4, or four years ago, um, or whatever it is, um, I, I wouldn't tolerate that. I mean, to, um, so toleration doesn't mean that you allow allow people to teach your children whatever they want. Toleration means you tolerate people's behavior. You tolerate people. Um, you don't tolerate ideas. Um, so this, this raises difficult questions about policy, which I don't address in the book because these are the really difficult questions about you know to what extent you should allow people to um, do things like you know have schools where they where they teach falsehoods. Um, and that's a problem not just for religion, that's also a problem for, um, for all sorts of other worldviews. And there's, I, I wouldn't like my children to be taught political falsehoods um, any more than um, religious falsehoods. Um, but when I, when I talk about toleration, uh, I make the point that Bernard Williams made many years ago, which is that toleration essentially involves disapproval. Um, so you, you can only tolerate that with, with which you disapprove. So although I would not tolerate my children being taught um, that the theory of evolution was false at school, um, I will tolerate people who go around saying that the theory of evolution is false. That's something I disapprove of. Um, um, because, because our aim in society should be to try and live in peace with each other. And that involves tolerating things that you find false or, or ridiculous, uh, or even offensive to some extent. I suppose my aim here was to just get clear on the idea that you know, tolerate, toleration of religion is not the same thing as saying um, everything's fine from their point of view, or you know, having a relativist view of um, religious belief, or since they believe it, it's okay, or you can't correct, you can't correct other people's views because, you know, who are you to correct their views? Uh, none of that follows from the idea of toleration. In fact, I think the opposite follows. Um, Professor Crane, thank you for this interview. It was a pleasure discussing these uh, things with you. Thanks very much for asking me. It's great to talk to you. Thanks.